What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. In this Season 2 Bonus Pod 3, CT and I sit down with former St. Louis Cardinals and Chicago White Sox prospect, the baseball and softball motivator, CJ Beatty. You can follow him on Instagram and Twitter at CJ Beatty 44 to watch all the latest inspirational videos, original music, original content straight from the horse's mouth. CJ was one of the most interesting interviews that I had ever been a part of in the show. I think CT would say the same thing. He uh, he takes us through his entire life pretty much. And uh, he, his life is pretty interesting. I mean, I mean, like most athletes, he grew up as the best player in his town or his neighborhood. And that was the case all the way through college. And then he got signed by the St. Louis Cardinals. And he gets on the ball field with a whole bunch of guys just like him, a whole bunch of guys who were the best players in their neighborhoods. And uh, things take a turn from there. I want CJ to tell the story because he is a tremendous storyteller. And um, yeah, man, he, he goes through it in, in grave detail and it's very entertaining. And, and CT and I were gripped the entire time. And so I want to thank CJ for coming on the show. And without further ado, here's the interview. Tell us first and foremost, what does CJ stand for? I need to know your full name, man. Yep, my first name is Christian, and my, my middle name is Jero, like Al Jero, the singer. Okay. And my last name is Baby, so CJ stands for Christian Jero. Nice. Thanks. And so, C- CJ, in doing some research, I saw that you were born in Winston Salem, North Carolina. Uh, were you also raised there? Oh yeah, yeah, Winston Salem, baby, you know. Uh, once the home of the Demon Deacons, the Wake Forest Demon Deacons, you know, I'm, I've been born and raised here in the Trey Folk. That's what we call it. If you nice. local, call it Not- Trey Folk. <laughs> um, so, so you were born and raised there. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, man. Tell, tell us about, you know, what's it like in C.J. Beatty's, you know, C.J. Beatty's life as a kid growing up in North Carolina. Man, man growing up for me was, I mean, it was fun times growing up. You know, of course, you've had those times where you say, well, it wasn't all fun was when you got told no by your parents by a lot of things. But other mm-hmm. than that, it was it was pretty cool for me growing up. I was the one that was very adventurous. If I had to talk about my upbringing, adventurous. I made something out of nothing. If they told me, if they kept me stranded when I was younger in a, in a room in timeout, I was the one that was trying to build something or try mm-hmm. to climb out or reconstruct something. So... There was never a dull moment then, and there's never a dull moment now. So, I mean, I'm just a person that's that's always trying to uh, figure something out and do something, get my hands on something, you know. So that's, that's the type of person I'm a go-getter. Good. I'm a go-getter, man. What's up? That's good. And and did you – do you have siblings? Do you have any siblings you grew up with, or were you an only child? No, nah, man. I'm the oldest of four, and okay. I have two younger brothers and one younger sister. Damn. So if you were the go getter and you're the oldest of four, what must your younger <laughs> your younger siblings be like? You know what? To be honest with you, I feel like I feel like I zapped all of that energy from them. <laughs> like I, I, feel, I feel like I took it all, man. You know, because you know, as the, I took the athleticism. I mean, they're they're athletes. I'm not gonna knock my my brothers and sisters, but whenever we put a that in their hand, it just doesn't come off as, as, as hard as I did when I was their age, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, I feel like I feel like all the ability kind of like went on my side of it. Nice. Yeah. Did, you, uh, did you so did you play anything else besides baseball growing up or was it just like strictly baseball? For me it was just strictly baseball. Uh, how about you? No, nah, man, I played uh, you know, baseball is my ticket but I played basketball, football, soccer, um, I played all of those sports growing up. I think the one that I gravitated to a lot other than baseball was football. But, I mean, I, I knew. I had some very um, caring parents that, that understood the process and understood what was my ticket, and they helped me to understand it. And playing football being the size that I was, I probably could have went to a, you know, a D1 double at best, you know, in a perfect world, um, size university. But in baseball, I, I, I had the, the skill set 
from what I was told to be able to go the distance, you know. So it was, it was for me, it was an easy transition for me to say, uh, after my junior year of playing, like, this is it, no more football, I'm focusing my final year on baseball. So was your decision to play baseball um, primarily based on the fact that as you just stated, from my understanding, that you that you were more gifted at baseball, there was more, there was more opportunities there for you, or is it because you you love the game more than than the others? I mean, I, I love baseball more than the others, but being a high schooler, you want to continue to play both. Yeah. You know what football gives you on a Friday night is something that baseball uh, it's like apples to oranges, but you know that that Friday night under the lights in high school. <laughs> That's a feeling that baseball can't give you in high school. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's um, true. It's a different level of intense. It's a different level of intensity, and I and I thrived in those moments. But I had to understand that you know, risking injury. Um, I had to understand that I, if I wanted to go the distance in baseball, I needed to be able to really channel and channel my focus in one area. So it was an easier transition for me to do that. Is uh so I I'm 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 from New York City, born and raised in New York City, but I I uh currently I lived in I live in Central Pennsylvania, and high school football is huge here. Like if you turn on the local news, you don't hear about the Philadelphia Phillies or or the Eagles. You hear about the high school football team here. Um, is that kind is that kind of the same? Was that kind of the same experience that you had, or not? No, nah, I don't think that it was – high school isn't – because North Carolina isn't a pipeline for high school uh, football like it could right. be up there. Um, you know, North Carolina is basically known for ACC basketball. Okay, you, know, true. you know, ACC basketball. So it's, basketball is more prominent, I feel like, in the state high school-wise than any other sport. Okay. Uh, okay, so the next question was, so you your junior year you decide I'm going to – play strictly baseball, what happens then your senior year? Like, do you do you turn into, like, a super athlete in your high school? Are you better than everybody else and you know that you're going to go places? Or is it still kind of a struggle for you? How does, how does you know, how does your baseball career develop from there? Man, I'm telling you, I mean, it sounds so cliche to say it, man, but I was blessed. God, God blessed me with the talent. I still worked hard. I mean, don't get that twisted. I've, I've, there's been plenty of times. And my parents went on record saying that this kid put his video games down just to go outside and throw a ball up and hit it. Mm. Like, I just fell in love with baseball. Um, and I've had that knack since T-ball. I've always – I mean, it's easy to be the best one in T-ball. You just got to run the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, True. <laughs> so that, that, that was easy for me. But I excelled at every level that I went to. Um, when I got to high school, I was all state. I, I played varsity as a, fre- as a 13-year-old freshman because I started school early. I batted third. I was the number one pitcher at 13 and 14 years old. Um, you know, so it was – baseball came nat- very natural for me. So in my, my junior year, um, which is so odd to say at this day and age with recruiting the way that it is, but that, back when I was in school, I have a picture that shows me sitting at a table the day that I signed I dumped out all my letters. I had over 65 letters to go to basically any school in the country. Wow. You know, they all came through my, my mailbox. And people be like, yeah, right. I'm like, dude, no, seriously, what do you think this picture shows? Mm-hmm. This ain't Photoshop. This is back in the day because it's pixelated. <laughs> like, yeah. this is back in the day, homie. But um, so it, it really came natural for me, man. But a lot of the natural ability came from just my, my relentless to, to want to be the best. I, okay. I worked hard every day, wanting to be the best. So, so currently you're a motivational speaker, right? But were you, did you consider yourself somewhat of a leader and a motivational speaker back then as a peer to your teammates? You know, you know, they called me a leader, but I never really did consider myself a leader. You know, I didn't say, man, since I'm the leader, I need to speak up right here. You know, it was just I, 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 um, I say as my parents instill that leader, those leadership traits inside of me um, because I always gravi- people always gravitated towards me for motivation, but that was way before I became a motivational speaker. That was early. You know, it was just that I love to help people. Back then, I wanted to be, make people feel good, feel wanted, and feel a part of, the, part of the family or team. So, you know, yeah, I've always had those leadership traits. So, 
so if you so let's say you hadn't let's say you would have embraced this motivation speaker role back then uh do you think you would have done anything different do you think you would have went to school instead um nah because back when i was eight years old before i even knew how to be a leader really <laughs> eight and nine is when i made up in my mind that i wanted to be a major league baseball player yeah, you know, that's amazing so i was i was on that so, as soon as I made up my mind back then, I was on that fast track. King Griffey Jr., him hitting a home run and being on Wheaties boxes, it messed me up mentally. Mm. That's, all that I, <laughs> that's all that I was wanting to be right there. So you mentioned Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, I think we might be around the same age because he was growing up to – I'm a Yankees fan, but anytime Ken Griffey Jr. came up to bat or, – or I don't know if you remember this, but back in the day, Sports Center would just run on a loop in the mornings. Um so summer mornings, I'd be home and I'd watch Sports Center over and over and over and over again, just waiting for that Ken Griffey Jr. That sweet swing, man. That thing was so beautiful. But um, it brings me to this question. That was a little tangent, like I said before. Uh, <laughs> what team did you grow up rooting for, and which player did you did you look up to, and and why? I looked up to Ken Griffey Jr. and Derek Jeter. You know, those are my two sports idols because my parents taught me about being a leader on and off the field. And that's why I chose them to, of course, you have King Griffey Jr. King Griffey Jr. Being, you know, known as the kid with the mm -hmm. hat with the swag and the wiggle and all of that stuff. You got the captain, Derek Jeter, that rose up through the, through the ranks and, you know, takes the pinstripes by storm from the shortstop position, you know, but the one thing that I gravitated towards was how they were in the limelight signing autographs. Mm -hmm. They were in the limelight going to school, speaking at elementary schools. You know, that was back in the day when they had Sports Illustrated, the mm -hmm. magazine. So every time I would go to the doctor's office or the dentist's office, on the little coffee table was a Sports Illustrated, and Derek Jeter and Ken Griffey Jr. was in there, you know, giving bottles out, bottles of water out in the community. You know, yeah. things like that is really drawing me to them on and off the field. And I, because I wanted to say, when I said back then, man, I want to be just like them. You know? So I think that that's the real reason why I gravitated towards those two. That's funny that you bring up the Sports Illustrated magazines because when I was a kid around the same time, uh, I remember my eighth grade teacher paid us, paid me and my best friend Gus to go to his classroom and clean up his classroom at the end of the school year. And he didn't pay us in money or anything because, of course, that's illegal. He had a stack of old Sports Illustrated magazines like from, from weeks prior, and that was good enough for us. And it wasn't even like we were reading the stuff. We were just looking at the pictures of, of the same players you mentioned, Jeter and, and Griffey and mm -hmm. Frank Thomas and all these guys. Um, it's insane, man, how the world has changed because now – you know, there's there isn't that physical thing that the kids can look at. It's all on on Instagram and and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So after high school, where do you go? Uh, what's the next step? You know, I, it was a tough decision. You know, it really was a tough decision. Like I wanted my dream school, believe it or not, was to go to Florida State. But it's hard to go to a school that didn't send you a letter. <laughs> so oh, I was like, yeah. okay, <laughs> well, that was one of the people that uh, that snuck through. So. Once I didn't get a letter from them, my parents said, hey, you might not want to go to a school that's not interested in you. So mm -hmm. I switched to uh, the next school I chose, uh, showed a lot of interest in me, and I was interested in them, was UVA, University of Virginia. Okay. Um, so they, I mean, they, they loaded me down with letters, but on my first official, it's crazy. I mean, this is what happens when you get a 16- and 17-year-old to make a decision. Uh, on my first official visit to NC State in Raleigh, North Carolina, I noticed how far that drive was. And granted, at that time, it was only an hour and 40 minutes from my house. But yeah. since I'm such a homebody, yeah. always around my cousin and everything, I was just like, what if I want to come home? What if I want to be home for the weekend and I don't have a car? I'm going to have to get somebody to drive me an hour and 40 minutes. Then I got to go an hour and 40 minutes back. Mm. Oh, my God, this is crazy. So then as soon as I made that official visit, I was like, well, UVA is out. That's four hours. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going to that school. And then I said, well, NC State has offered me, but at the end of the day, it's an hour and 40, uh, you know, I think I might go to Elon. Elon is in Burlington, North Carolina. They're in the SoCon <laughs> Conference. Uh, they're 45 minutes away. That's doable. Gave me a hell of a scholarship. I'm like, man, go Phoenix. I'm on the way to Elon. <laughs> in North Carolina AMT, 25 minutes from the house, D1 baseball. 
gave me an offer I couldn't refuse, like the, like the mafia. I'm gonna give you an offer you can't. <laughs> <laughs> so they gave me an offer of a full freaking scholarship, all baseball money. I ain't talking about piecing it together. I'm mm. talking about all baseball money. You know, they said, CJ, God forbid you flunk out, but your, that money will still be available to you. That's how much we love you and want you to come to our school. You know, they gave me, they gave me the, uh, I guess I can go on record saying they gave me the Reg, the Reggie Bush package, you know. Nice. Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was treated like royalty at that school. Um, but it was, that I fell in love. It was 25 minutes down the road, a very, very um, on the up and up um, baseball program that my family, church family, anybody that wanted to hit I-40 and drive 25 minutes to see me play was able to do so. That's what I was really centered around. Plus the scholarship was, was great. And uh, so, you know, did any players come out of this program? Did you ever consider, you know, is this going to be the best thing for me moving forward? Or was it like any other, you know, college kid? Like for me, when I was in college, I was just trying to go one day at a time. I wasn't really thinking about the future. Was that the same thing for you? Or did you still have Major League Baseball on the back of your mind? Uh, man, Major League Baseball was always in my mind. I was that kid that was like, yo, man, you know how they, they in Love and Basketball, they called the girl Spalding? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the movie Love and Basketball. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, yeah. I was that guy. Every time I walked into a building, they, you know, I was, they nicknamed me Hollywood because I was just like, man, it was almost like in high school, I was almost like primetime Deion Sanders. Yeah. Like you just knew like this guy was, he was, he was getting drafted. You know, my belief level, I feel like that's what I can contribute to a lot of my success because it wasn't that I was just, yeah, I can come off to other people at that particular time as arrogant, but if you got to know me, you just knew that I worked hard. And at the end mm-hmm. of the day, I was confident in where I was going, you know? So when I got to college, the first thing on my mind was, I know I'm a freshman and they say fresh meat, but I'm letting these, I'm putting these guys on notice. Mm-hmm. They ain't never met CJ Baker before. I'm coming in here and I'm taking somebody's spot I'm going to beat a man, and then in my junior year, I'm getting drafted, and I'm going to the league. You know, that, that was my mentality when I was in college. And is that what happened? Did you get drafted in your junior year? It, I sure did. I came nice. in. I got, you know, my, my, my freshman year, I was freshman All-American, Louisville Slugger All-American. Uh, I was first team, all-conference my freshman year. I was rookie of the year in the conference. For my school, I was uh, freshman of the year. Sophomore year, first team again. Mm-hmm. Sophomore year in my school, male athlete of the year. Junior year, the same thing, drafted. Crazy, so, man. So then, all right, so then you get drafted 2009, correct, by the Cardinals. And what, what was your what was your belief system then? Like, was it everything that you thought it would be in the minor leagues? Or did you feel like... I, I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to ask is I'm looking at the whole Kyler Murray situation that just recently happened and how had he chose baseball, he'd he'd have to go through the minors for a couple of years before making it to the big stage. Like was the was the minors everything you expected up until that point? Um, you know, <laughs> I'm going to just say this. The minor leagues of professional baseball turned me into a mental savage for success. And that's what birthed me as a motivational speaker to put that on record. Yeah. You know, the grind. I, I've i always grinded, but I've never grinded like that before. Because once you get drafted, you're not only just the best person anymore, you're surrounded by a lot of best people. Yeah. That's why they got drafted. So I had to take my mentality. See, what happened, what happened to me, guys, is that I got my physical ability got me there, but what allowed me to leave and not fulfill what I wanted to fulfill was the lack of mentally. Because all of my life, I've always been the best, so I really didn't have to understand the importance of growing your mentality. Hmm. When I got to that level, I, that's what happens. Everybody's good at that level. Everybody has physical ability at the pro level. Right. But what separates them is the mentality. And at that point, I felt like I was prime time Hollywood that I didn't need to grow my mind, but not wanting to grow my mind is the reason why I was unfortunately released at that time. Mm. And so you were released, I think two years later by the St. Louis Cardinals. What happens after that? Like, where does your career take you? 
yeah, when I so when I got released, you know, that was a tragic day. Okay. You know, getting released and 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 trying to figure out how to put the pieces together with no with no agent. I just drove ten and a half hours in my Mercedes Benz all the way back down to mm. Florida for spring training with high hopes. You know, no, you can't you never see this coming. Then the day comes, and I'm released, and a week and a half later, I'm packing my bag to the hotel, driving 10 and a half hours back home, on and out, because I'm too embarrassed to tell people. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm crying. Crying. The only reason I stopped is to use the restroom and for gasoline. I didn't have to eat. I got a speeding ticket on the way back, the first one I've ever had. Like the world was crashing down on me. But that's where I found myself in that release. And that's why I teach people as motivational speakers. It's just like you're gonna find you're gonna find your you're gonna find yourself in the midst of adversity. And that's when I found myself. And at that point is when I said, look, I'm gonna dry these tears up and I'm gonna ma- I made up in my mind right then and there that they cut a person that they'll never see again. Because I'm gonna come back bigger, stronger, faster. I'm going to come back hungry for success. And that's when the Sabbath is born. So, you know, yeah, go ahead, CT. I just want to say that for the first time in this show, man, I really like felt that right there. Like I, I, I almost like felt like I was in that car <laughs> on the way back. <laughs> man. Thank, yeah, thank, crazy. thank you, man. I, I appreciate it. What yeah, was I that? Mean, I, was that for like for you? Would you consider that to be your rock bottom? Yo, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's for sure my rock bottom. That was it. That's mm-hmm. that was the point at where prime time Hollywood Beatty got humbled. Mm-hmm. And I, I had to understand that I didn't know everything. I didn't know everything. I had I had to have something like that happen to humble me to say, look, humble yourself but be hungry. Yeah. Humble yourself but be hungry. That's awesome, man. Well, awesome that you had that that you know realization that epiphany in a way. I mean, it sucks that you got you know that you got released, um, but I don't want to keep harping on the negative. But um, did you see it coming, or or did it come as a surprise to you? No, at that time it came as a surprise. I didn't understand why they released me until I became a pro scout for the Cardinals. Okay. Like much later on in my life, 2016, when I when I was hired on as a scout for the Cardinals, that's when I realized why they released me. Okay. You know, and, I knew, and, and what do you? I, knew, what, and, I, knew, and, I knew. I knew. I knew. Now go ahead. I'm sorry. I knew years before. Then, I, I knew years before then. Like I kind of understood a little bit. I probably, you know, it was like, okay, I can I can see why they released. Okay, I can see. Oh yeah, 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 I can see. But until I became a pro scout on the other side of the fence, a mm-hmm. pro coach on the other side of the fence from the same organization, that's mm-hmm. when I realized why they released me. Hmm. So, sorry, man, are you were saying something? It's all you. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to just you, you. You mentioned not having like how your physical abilities got you there, but you didn't have the mental toughness to be to be a professional. But are you speaking more in terms of like? the grind of a minor league season, how you guys are always traveling and not getting the same luxuries as major league players? Or do you mean more in terms of like knowing how to accept failure and being humble? No, no. What I mean by it, I just, I can put it to you in a small package, black and white response answer for you. Here it is. I was not a student of the game. I didn't study the game. I just showed up, I hit the ball hard, I threw the ball hard, and I tried to outrun everybody. That was it. That was it. See ball, hit ball. And I thought that that was it. So, look, there are a small percentage of Major League Baseball players, very small, that think that way and can succeed. I wasn't. I wasn't one that could think see ball, hit ball, and get paid millions. Mm -hmm. It's not like that for everybody. You know, there's there's only a few, there's probably a handful of people up there, and they're superstars. I wasn't one of those. I was blessed with some God-given talent, but I wasn't on that level where I could just say, see ball, hit ball, and that was it. I was not a student of the game. And in order for me to become that, somebody had to teach me that. I didn't have anybody teach me that growing up. Mm -hmm. I was always the biggest fish in the pond 
So how in the world would somebody ever teach me how to grow my mind if I'm the best one there? True. And not to get off on another thing, but that's why it's imperative that parents understand how to push their kids and not let them excel all the time, every year, every year, being the big fish in the small pond. Mm-hmm. You yeah. got to continue to push your kid. You got to continue to put them in a situation where they can grow, not thrive and winning. Because what's going to happen when adversity hits? St. Louis Cardinals, when they release me, mm-hmm. when adversity hits, you're going to sit there confused, like why? But that's because yeah. no adversity has ever happened. You've always positioned them to be great. So whenever they get punched one time, Mike Tyson. When Buster mm-hmm. Douglas finally drops Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson ain't never been touched before. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely he never, right. He was never the same. Yeah, he lost yeah. that. Uh, that. Uh, that was. That, that was. It. Yeah, that was it. That was it after after that for Mike. That's crazy, uh-huh. man. And so, so then, how do you end up back with the Cardinals as a pro scout? Well, I mean, just a quick rundown. So when I got released from when I got released from the Cardinals, I wanted a way back. I went to independent baseball. Okay. I went down to Edinburgh, Texas. I got signed on there to go down there and play. I I just thought, and it was just crazy to stay with me here. I'm going to go quickly. I just thought all I had to do was just bang my way back, and I will just get another scout to see me and sign me. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not the case in independent baseball. It's about timing and positioning. Mm-hmm. It's about timing and positioning. You can rake, rake, rake your whole life down there in independent baseball and never get a chance. So my first year, I didn't know that. I just thought, man, look, it's easy. I'm going to go down here and rake. I'm going to go find a team that's going to play every day. Cool. I rake. I bet it, and it was one of the lower levels of independent baseball, but I rate. I batted over 320, 17 home runs, 22 doubles. Didn't get an invite to spring training. Hmm. It's cool. I was cool. Don't worry about it. I went to another team the following year because I got released in 2011. 2012, I went down there. 2013, you know what I did? I came back. This year, this year in 2013, um, I went down, I came back to Fort Worth Cats. And I didn't have a lot of bombs because we played in the graveyard for left-handed hitters. <laughs> so I didn't have a lot of bombs, but I still batted 292 with nine home runs and I think 19 doubles. Still didn't get a, still didn't get a slip. But it's cool. Don't even worry about it. Got the opportunity to go to Australia. I played baseball in Australia for a year. Made the all-star team with the man. Ironically, they called me nickname Hollywood. That's great, man. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the whole fans called me Hollywood. You know, you can go on YouTube and you can see me smack home runs and see the hear the fans call Hollywood. <laughs> crazy, right? But, but um boom, after I got after I got back, I signed with another independent team in Pennsylvania, you might have heard the Washington Wild thing. Hmm. Signed with them, right in right in Western PA. And that was home for me for about three years. Ouch. So while I was there my first <laughs> year, yeah I know, right? Western PA. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but look, but look, I ain't gonna hate because I got I got some friends and family out there, so I ain't going to hate. But I know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> so uh, my first year there, I made the All Star team. I did, I put up some some monstrous numbers again. Another year, I think I, another year of eight, seventeen home runs. Uh, seventeen was my number for some reason. Hmm. Around seventeen ish home runs. Didn't get picked up. I got a lot of sniffs, but didn't get anybody to pull the trigger. Um, the next year, the next year, I um, come back to the same team, get 18 on the run. But see, here's the thing. The following year, and it's crazy how life works. The following year, I decided I was getting ready to move my then-girlfriend from Texas up to Pittsburgh. And we was ready to start a life. I was going to move from North Carolina up there because I was the man for Washington Wild Things. I, I had a job lined up, had a job lined up for her. I was going to retire. Like, Crash Davis of Indy Ball. It's be an Indy Ball legend. Hmm. The year that I decided to not chase scouts was when the Chicago White Sox called <sighs> and said, and we want to sign this guy. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I've, been, I've been waiting for another opportunity so long that, that I've got gray hair in my beard. And now you want to tell me when I'm, when I'm trying to line things up to start off and ride off in the sunset, you want to call me and ask? I didn't say that to the White Sox. I was like, hell yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so they signed me and I went to high A. I went to high A. 
uh, in my hometown of Winston Salem. Like it's like storybook. Wow. They signed me to go back to my hometown of Winston Salem, North Carolina, the place for the high A dash in my hometown. It was like the little big leagues for me. I went up there. I played, had a great season, and everything. Uh, got invited back to their spring training. I, I raked and every everything was just going good. I batted 404 with with, uh, with three home runs, uh, two triples, eight doubles. I, you know how I know this because I kept my stats. I'm an mm-hmm. independent ball player. I gotta smash everybody if I want to make get a spot. So I kept mm-hmm. my stats. Thought that in the oh, I said finally there's a team that's allowing me to play. I did that at the double A, triple A level in the spring training. I was like, hell yeah, this is it. Maybe the White Sox is my calling to get to the league. After spring training, they said we're sending you back to high A. I said, what? I'm 27 years old. Oh man, I'm old enough to be a coach almost. What are you sending back to? Okay, you know what? I ain't gonna worry about it. It's cool. I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna ball out. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna force them to send me to double A. It's cool. I get there, we get off the bus, we have a meeting in the coaches, the coaches lounge. They say, we're making you our fifth outfield. I said, what? Wow. The fifth outfield? I, I just demolished spring training. I had to be one of the top three hitters in all of minor league spring training. Had to be. So so much the coaches were shaking their head, I was destroying the ball. But you're making me the fifth outfield? I said, okay, cool. You know what? Sucked it up as a motivational guy. I said, you know what? I just need a crack in the door. That's all I need. If you're going to play me every Monday and Thursday school, on those Mondays and Thursdays, I'm going to be hell. I'm going to hit bombs until they put me on the panel deal. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you see what this story is doing? But now you see why I'm such a, quote, unquote, good motivational speaker, because I come from stories of adversity, you know? Um, so I kept, I kept battling out. I had to uh, I had to do the unthinkable. I had to ask for my release after being on the DL for twenty plus days wow. in my hometown. I'm in my hometown. People are traveling, coming, they see me play and never see me exit the dugout. That sucks. That's crazy. Yeah, That's man. crazy, right? Man. So I had to ask I had to ask for my unconditional release. What were, go back what... where I knew I was gonna play. What was why did they put you on the DL? What were you suffering an injury or was it just like to clear a, a roster spot or something? What to was clear, that about? To clear a roster spot, but to be honest with you, they finally came out and told me the reason why is just they didn't anticipate me doing so well. Hmm. Wow, you that's know, crazy. They signed me. They signed me because the now shortstop Tim Anderson, my friend, pulled his hamstring and they needed somebody to fill that spot. So they signed the indie ball guy. That's what they do now. They signed the indie ball guy to come fill a spot, a roster spot, because they don't have anybody. If somebody at the lower levels is making a playoff push, they don't want to break that team up. So you just sign the independent free agent. You go find the next best thing in independent ball, and you sign them. See, but what happened was they thought that I was going to come in and not hold my own and release myself. But little did they know that I came in and I balled out. So you really – I mean, you can, but technically you try to wait for somebody to slip on a banana so you can give them an excuse to release them, but I never Mm -hmm. slipped. I never slipped, so they kept me. They were like, man, we can't release this guy. Like, he's he's good. He's he's like a leader. He's like another coach, you know, and uh, he's balling. But we just don't have any space for him because we didn't think he was going to make it this far. It's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it, it is crazy. So so anyway, I asked my unconditional release. I went back to Washington because I said, man, I made up in my mind that 2015 was going to be my last year. I said, this is going to be my last year. I do not want to waste it getting swimmers on my butt. So at the end of the day, I said, get my release. It was right before Washington cranked up. I called them. They had, Of course, they're going to have a spot for me. Um, I went back there, spring training, and as the story tells, I was doing good until I pulled my quad. First injury of my professional career. Jesus Christ, man. Pulled the quad. <laughs> pulled the quad, dude. I pulled the quad. I'm tell I'm not making this up. I pulled the quad. Uh the team was on the travel. I did my therapy and everything like that. Um I felt like I they got me they patched me up to the point where I rehabbed it for about a week, week and a half. Um they came back from the week road trip and I was ready. In my mind I was, but I really wasn't. But I knew that I could DH and I can still swing the bat hard. I couldn't run hard, but 
but I can still swing hard. Uh, they cleared me. I, I impressed them enough to then clear me. I hit a home run that game. For some odd reason, the very next day before the next game, the Wild Things ownership said that I'm a liability since I'm clearly not since I'm clearly not um, I'm healed. After hitting a home run and winning the game on that Sunday, they said, we're putting you back on the DL. I said, you know, DL is not in my vocabulary. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so if you say that, you put me on the DL, y'all might as well say that I'm going home. Because if y'all put me back on that DL, I'm, I'm going home. They put me on the DL. You know what I did? I packed my car up and I hobbled home. And I drove all the way back home. Man. And when I drove home, I made up in my mind that I was like, man, I'm done. You know, I gave it everything that I got. I got another opportunity with the White Sox. Um, I balled out. I surpassed every written goal that I had for the year. Uh, it's just, I'm, I'm just over it. I'm over it. But I just want to turn the page and move on. So I wanted to go into coaching. I, I, I submitted my my um, request to coach. I heard about the Cardinals, and I, I did it on good terms with the Cardinals. So I reached out to them, and I said, hey, man, you have any coaching spots open? They said they had this fourth coach spot open that you can apply for. Um, we're putting a good word for you. To make a long story short, I became the fourth coach of the Cardinals where I was the only scout in the New York Penn League for the Cardinals. And I was also the assistant hitting coach for the State College Spikes in the New York Penn League. So I had a dual role, which was great because it's a huge, humongous resume builder, you know, because I'm the pro scout and a pro hitting coach. Yeah. So I was like, oh, this, you know, so, but that's, 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 um, that's kind of like, uh, yeah, that's that's sorry to go on that long tangent. No, it's all good. It's all good. That, that was, was great, good. man. That was yeah, great. I, and I I have to imagine that when you get a a coaching job, that you start to see the motivational thing that you're a good motivator with people. I've seen some of the videos you put out there on Instagram. There was one a softball player. I don't know if it was you that published it or if it was her. But I was like, man, this guy, man, like I feel like running through a wall right now. <laughs> uh, Thank you. you know, you must have that must have helped you to develop this you know am i right or you know or not or is this just something that's in you that's been in you this whole time <laughs> man to be honest with you i think it's been in me this whole time but i just didn't understand how to perfect it until i wanted to make this a career okay like i started i started um my company with uh, motivational nuggets okay. back when i came back from my first stint in australia when I came back from my first stint in Australia is when I launched Motivational Nuggets. And um, I was still playing. I launched it in 2013. I didn't retire until 2015. Mm -hmm. So um, at that point, at that point is when I knew that, man, I really want to be a motivational speaker. I still want to play and go to the league, but at the end of the day, when I get done, I want to be a motivational speaker. So really what it helped me, because when I retired from playing, I was arguably just 28 years old. Like, I can still physically play the game. Hell, I'm 30. I can still play this game. I can definitely go overseas and go to Mexico, uh, uh, Panama, Nicaragua, mm -hmm. Japan. You know, I can go anywhere and still play the game. Um, but motivational speaking really took a hold of my heart and my passion to mm -hmm. help people. Just like something that baseball could never give me. Um, baseball, I love it. And it's still be being in the industry still pays my bills. Mm -hmm. However, me standing on stage, motivating people is something that baseball never gave me. Mm. And right there, and that right there is what drives me more. You know, drives me more to be able to pour into people. And once I was able to identify that that feeling, that's what helped me say I'm done. That's what helped me say twenty because people just say the way you told that story and and your quad blowing out, and for everything that was going in your favor, you just came off the best spring training. Like, how do you say you're done after that type of a year? You got to, like, rest up and want to go back. But if y'all understood the gravitational pull that motivational speaking was pushing, was pulling me, you would understand and say, I get it. Motivational speaking in my company was like my child. Yeah. So if I birthed my child in 2013, 2015, all that adversity happens, of course, your child is going to be like, you know what? I'm about to go chill with my son. <laughs> I ain't got time for this. <laughs> I'm about to go. Y'all like, want to go ahead and crap all on my face about stuff. I'm about to go play with my son and help raise my child. 
And that's the way I looked at my business. I was like, man, you know what? I'm tired of sitting down watching my business take the back seat. So here's a here's a here's a quick loaded question, and you could be honest as honest as possible with it, or or you could say, yeah, I don't know, I don't know if I can answer that right now. Do you feel like you've gotten more out of motivating others than? And this is a hypothetical because we will never know. But in your in your mind, do you feel like you you get you're getting more out of motivating others, being a motivational speaker? than you would have gotten, say, by being called up to the major leagues? You know what I'm saying? I, you know what? I honestly feel seriously that I get more out of being a motivational speaker and long-term, seriously. Okay, of course, you can say financially, but when you talk about fulfilling yourself right. in life, I feel like what I'm doing right now, and I knew that when I took on this journey and stopped playing, Right now, it's going to give me way more than what being a base being a baseball player at the major league level is going to give me. Okay. Because I feel like if I would have think of it this way, guys, you've known you you you've known uh, you've learned a lot of stuff about me in a short amount of time to know this. If I would have continued on that, every level I got to, I thrived. Every level I got to, I did great. And then I was going to get to the major league, and then I was going to end up being this. What kind of adversity would I have been able to have to turn me into that savage to help other people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I probably would have been, you know, speaking in school. Yeah, I probably would have been like started a charity. Yeah, I would have been like that. But the person that I am now came because I missed the mark. Mm-hmm. The, I'm impacting thousands. Like my my Instagram page has <laughs> over 2.3 million impressions a freaking month. I reach so many people on my little platform that I have, and that's just because of motivation. Right. You know, if I, if I, of course I would reach a lot of people, you know, like if I had 5.3 million, if I was a major league baseball all-star, but those people are, they're really not utilizing their platform like I am. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I might put up a post like, hey, man, I'm body armor. I'm in here working out for my next season. And I might reach millions of people. But I don't think I would have been the same person that I am now if I would have been able to have everything at the major league level. Yeah. Another another thing, too, is that if, if I am looking at an all-star on TV, that's he's like a superstar. I'm not seeing any adversity. I'm just seeing the success. So, you know. You're right. You know, you're, you're showing people the adversity and the other side as well. See, you want to hear something that's crazy and scary? Here's the thing that's scary about it. And I had to, I had to have, I had to fight with myself because at times whenever I feel, I mean, you know, I name people all the time that I played travel ball with, showcase ball with, that I batted in front of growing up that are at the major league level that are starring. I have major league friends that are there currently that tell me over the phone, like, dude, you should be here. You just didn't get the ball to bounce your way. But the one thing that helps me is, and this is, this is no slight to anybody. This is not me saying that, that these guys are not helping people because there's some that are right. But the, the thing that that's scary is I feel that, that there are people in the major leagues that are not utilizing their platforms the way that they should, like back in the day they used to. We don't. Social media has put a damper uh, has put a damper on showing the good that the guys that are doing good that are they're not showing it. Hmm. We when we grew up, they showed King Griffey Jr. Derek Jeter giving water out in the community. They yeah. can you even in all sports. I'm talking to all sports. Can you name the last time that somebody has showed something great that a superstar has done other than LeBron in the school? Mm-hmm. I can't. No, I can't think of one. <laughs> no, all you all you see today is like the the drama, pretty much. You see drama, and you see the stuff that they want you to see: the home runs and the celebrations and the and the Pepsi commercials and all. They don't show that anymore. And I feel like that's a dying breed. Yeah. I feel like 
I feel like somebody at the level needs to step up and they need to be able to do that. And 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 that's one that's one thing that I feel the why why I like the path that I have. Because even though my platform might not be million, I still have this 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 controlled environment where I'm letting people see me fight to pour into people. You know, and I mean there's people out there that you know, the real heroes are the ones that are up for nominees as the Roberto Clemente Award. Those are the real heroes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the Walter Payton Award, you know, in the NFL, that's the real hero. What you're doing off the field, those are the real heroes. You know, I feel like if they praise them guys more, it would help shape the world. I agree. I agree too. And I think that there's a lot of guys out there who, you know, are probably very similar to you in that they do want to help their communities. They do want to, you know, motivate others. But I also feel like the business aspect of the game kind of muffles all of that. And it just seems like we don't get to see who these guys really are anymore. Um, it's just a business. You know what I'm saying? And that, that kind of sucks. I love the game. I'll never stop watching it. But you know that part of that part of the game i don't like so much <clears throat> yeah man it, and you know I, I get it's a business but at the end of the day it takes somebody like me and you or somebody to sit down at the mountaintop and say i know it i get it we're making our money however we still got to grow the world right. like if i sat in that chair and i had that authority to be able to change the narrative that's how power social media is Power mm-hmm. of social media. If I had the opportunity to change the narrative, then I might not use all of my resources. But you got dang right, I'm gonna use some. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do something to show that we care about tomorrow. Yeah, man. That's yeah. what happened. So, CJ, we're about to we're gonna wrap this up in a few minutes. I just wanted to give you the the floor here. Basically, um, I'm a kid, you know, from the inner cities. I'm, I'm going to describe myself <laughs> as a kid. Okay, so okay. I grew up in, in a little neighborhood called Washington Heights. You know, there's no baseball fields around me. Um, I did go to Catholic school. I'm, gl- I'm grateful for that. But all we had was a basketball team, which I'm grateful for as well. But I, w- I really wanted to play baseball. And I wasn't a motivated kid to go out there and go find a team to play for, which I'm sure that there there were many of. Um, so in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, there's nothing else out there for me. You know, I'm just going to have to wait to till I grow up and I'll I'll follow in the footsteps of my father or something, do something that I don't really want to do and just settle for that. What do you say to a kid like that today? You know, I feel like kids... <laughs> Kids, first of all, the reason why kids have a lot of downfall in life is because of who they're hanging around. I feel like the first challenge is to really identify who you're hanging around as a kid. If you can figure out who you're hanging around and try to figure them out, what I mean by figure them out is just put them on paper. Put down Joe, Sally, Kim, Demario, whoever it is, on paper. Put a line down the center. One side says positive, and the right side says negative. And really identify who you're hanging around. If you're hanging around a bunch of people that have a lot of negative things, you need to stop that. So I would start there. I always start there, whether they're inner city or not. It's just say, listen, we got to identify who we're hanging around. Because a lot of times you don't believe in yourself because you're hanging around people that don't believe in you. You know, so so that right there is the first hurdle to get over. I can't build you up. Man, I can't build you up right now. How can I build you up when I, whenever you get off of this phone, you can go right back to the toxic environment? And you don't know how to get out of it. You know what's happening? You're wasting your time and mine. But it's not wasted if you know that, hey, I have direction. The first step is I got to get rid of this negative people that's around my life. So I think that that's the first thing. If you're an interested kid and you're listening to this and you want to, you don't have all the resources that you want, first identify who you're hanging around. And if you're hanging around nobody, then what are you? 
Mm-hmm. Nobody, because you don't, you listen to me closely. That saying, it makes sense. What you hang around is what you become. And if you agree, hanging around nobody makes you nobody. So what do you have to do? I'll tell you what. How about you utilize YouTube for things other than funny, funny videos? How about you, how about you <laughs> utilize YouTube to look at drills and things that you can do for free? YouTube is free, people. And we act as if it's not. It's free. Google is free. Mm-hmm. Wi-Fi is free at McDonald's. <laughs> true, true, true. <laughs> I feel like we just got to educate ourselves with the low hanging fruit. And if somebody can, if somebody can help these inner city kids to say, look, I want more out of life and give them step by step to want more of like, say, Hey, utilize YouTube, you know, um, ask more questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions because the only way you're going to get to an answer is by asking. The only way you're going to get to an answer is by asking questions. You know, just really empower them to want more out of life. Once you can start a kid, Wanting more out of life, then then life's law of attraction will start attracting them towards success. It'll pull them towards success. Nice, nice, nice. C- nice. Yeah, CJ, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. This is CJ Beatty. You can follow him on Instagram at CJ Beatty forty four. I believe it's the same handle on Twitter. Am I right? Yes, yes, yes. Same handle on Twitter at CJ Beatty forty four. Um, he's the life. He's a sorry. He's the baseball and softball motivator. I was gonna call you a, a life coach, which you are, by the way, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, man. Thank you so much. You guys have to follow him. Uh, the videos he puts out there are very, very inspirational. Um, and a lot of times you hear from athletes. Uh, in terms of you know showing you what their success is, like C- like CT said before. You only see what their success is. You don't see the 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 grind, and I think that CJ Beatty shows you the grind a little bit. Shows you when people are down, how they get themselves out of it, and and like I said before, makes you want to run through that wall and, and do what you need to do to get where you want to get. Um, so CJ, thank you so much for coming on the show, and uh, I hope that you'll come back on sometime soon. Oh yes, sir. It's an honor to be on, guys. Thank you, you and CT man. Y'all do a hell of a job. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Thank you very much. That was C.J. Beatty, CEO and founder of Motivational Nuggets. They call him the baseball motivator, the corporate motivator, the softball motivator. He was a 2009 MLB draft pick. And most importantly, he's an all-around good guy. I really loved and enjoyed speaking to C.J. Beatty. I hope you guys go out there and follow him on social media. He's on Twitter and Instagram primarily at C.J. Beatty 44. I'd love for you guys to visit his website, cjbeatty.com. Show your love, show your support. This guy is the real deal. And thanks again for listening, guys. Welcome to the show is brought to you by Audible. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show to get a free audio book download and a 30-day free trial. And for more exclusive deals like 10% off of KD Custom Kicks, where MLB players like Aaron Judge get their custom cleats or other sneakers, Visit WTTSPod.com forward slash save. The music, as always, is by Vian Varga and Rap Turnal pro- Music by Naughty Productions. And our artwork is by Luigi Gomez. Thanks again, guys. Peace. Peace.